Okay, I see your screen. The recording is in progress. So let me just jump to the intro quick and then we'll kick it off. Okay. So again, uh, just totally stoked to have Sylvia present uh, as part of the Carolinas chapter meeting. So a little intro about Sylvia. Sylvia's academic studies have focused on earthquake engineering. After finishing her PhD at UC Berkeley on the design and behavior of reinforced concrete structures, she became part of the Open Seas development team as the user support manager. In 2010, she joined the new technologies group at Dagen Kolb Engineers, where she was tasked with developing their ground motion and hazard capabilities. In 2013, she joined the Next Generation of Ground Motion Attenuation Program, now at UCLA under the leadership of Professor Yusuf Berzonia. Her focus is on the management of databases and support projects. Having reduced her university appointment to part-time, uh, Dr. Mazzoni is now working on several self-funded projects such as Sylvia's Brainery, an online academy on earthquake engineering courses focused on knowledge and understanding and developing software for ground motion selection and modification, as well as open seas user interfaces. All these efforts have the goal to make nonlinear response history analysis more accessible to all engineers. And without further ado, Dr. Mazzoni, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's nice to see uh, everyone here, a lot of old friends and uh, new people. So. Um, welcome. I, every time I make a presentation, I always try to put something new and different. So I, I hope everybody can get something new and out of uh, this presentation. You may have seen bits and pieces here and there. My goal here today is to talk about ground motions for um, analysis in engineering practice. And um, pretty much the objective of today's presentation is to give you a strong understanding of all the different components that go into the ground motions for engineering applications. Um, I'm gonna talk about all these different topics. I'm gonna give you an introduction, talk about probabilistic and deterministic analyses, because these I think are very important to understand uh, these concepts because uh, they really form the background of what you're doing with the ground motions. Uh, we're gonna talk about site-specific versus map spectra, multi-period spectra, and so that's all on the target side, on, on developing the target for your ground motions. And then I'm also going to talk about uh, the ground motion selection, scaling versus matching, and uh, highlights of things you need to consider when you're looking at in the near field with directivity and directionality. Again, I, I want to hit all these different topics so that at least the first time around, or maybe it's the nth time around, a little bit more goes in. Um, and I recommend if there's anything that you have questions on, plenty of resources online to, to get into more details of it. Um, I'm going to try to leave a, a few minutes at the end also for questions and discussion. Uh, so I'm looking forward to having input and feedback from everybody in this group. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so just an overview, why are we doing this? Uh, code compliance. A lot of us are in engineering practice, have to follow the direction of the building code. Uh, the building code is always evolving. I'm currently working in the different issue teams for you know the next generation of building codes, even though the ASC 722 just came into practice uh, in the last year or so. Um, the goal with ground motions is that we use the ground motions in numerical and physical models, even in shake table validations of different components uh, to assess the performance of the system. So the selection of ground motions is very important because depending on the type of ground motions you have, you may get a different uh, response in your system. For engineering practice, we also need hazard consistent earthquake ground motions to identify the relevant structural demands. Uh, and when we bring in hazard consistent, now we're talking about site dependent. It, the ground motions are very much dependent on your site. You can't just go in and get some target spectrum because it really depends on if you're in the central and the eastern US versus in a crustal zone versus subduction. Even in those cases, they're very different types of ground motions. And then the amplitude also changes because you may be very close to a fault or you may be far from a fault. And so those are the two components that come into your ground motions. And the target is the type of ground motions and the amplitude of these ground motions. ASC 7 requires right now a minimum of 11 
record pairs for each MCE sub R compatible target. And we'll talk about what this compatible with this MCE sub R target is. Um, and so you want these records to represent the full range of the ground motion characteristics that are relevant to your structure. So the seismicity, also your local site response, uh, the amplification, duration, pulse, all these different characteristics that are important at your site as well important to your structural response. And that's always the balance of, well, does this really matter? And we're always evolving and learning more about what is important, what isn't. Um, so we're gonna wanna select and scale and optionally modify ground motions to match your design target. It's that you're not always scaling to your design spectrum, uh, but your design spectrum is related to your target spectrum and it is at your site. Um, and so that really is important to think about your site specific or site dependent characteristics of your ground motion. So the process is this, and I'm gonna highlight all these different parts of it. Uh, the very first step is to determine your design spectrum at the site. How do you do it? You can use the USGS map spectrum. Uh, that is always improving, and it's really neat what this new version of the maps have nowadays. Uh, so I'll talk about that in the multi-period spectrum very quickly. Or you could do a site-specific analysis. Uh, also, what is the level? Are you designing for MCE? Or are you defining designing for different level earthquakes? Uh, if you're in different regions, maybe you have different criteria. Then are you using your spectrum, or are you doing conditional mean spectra? I am not going to talk about the conditional mean spectrum today, because it's a whole, every one of the things that I'm going to hit today are a whole other uh, Pandora's box, uh, but that's something that I'm just going to leave aside because there's plenty of other resources about it. Uh, once you have your target spectrum, you want to select your ground motions, as I've already mentioned. You want to have hazard consistent records. Um, from that, you need to determine what hazard consistent means is what are the controlling scenarios. And I, you use deaggregation to do that, and I'll show you where that comes into the process. And then you download these records. Once you've got the records, you scale them uh, and or you may actually optionally modify the records so that you have so that the mean of your spectra for your ground motions has some relationship to your target spectrum. Uh, modifying records can always just improve the match and depends on the different types of modifications that you're doing. And I'll talk about that. And then the very last step is to apply the records to the model and analyze. Um, in this case, you have to do some additional considerations in the near field. You may have to apply fault normal, fault parallel components instead of uh, the as recorded ground motions. So that's at the very last step. So I'm going to go through this different, the different aspects of this process. I'm going to highlight, spend a little bit more time on certain things that I've noticed in my experience. People have a, a more confused understanding, especially for the structural engineers. So I, I really want to show that it's really not that difficult until you you just need to sit down and, and visualize it and understanding. And that's really my goal for doing this today. So first step is uh, the target spectrum. What ground motions do you need and how big are they? So imagine always keep those two concepts in mind and that's defined by the seismicity at your site. Uh, you can do or you have to do two types of analyses, a probabilistic analysis and a deterministic analysis. And I'll show you what the difference is and what these two different types of analyses are. And then you can combine these depending on what you're doing. If you're doing a research project or something else is one thing. If you're doing a code compliant analysis uh, or target spectrum, then you definitely need to do both of these types of analyses. And they're there as tools to quantify the hazard at your site. Um, just a quick, I, I can't start talking about response spectrum without giving a definition uh, or at least building a visual. Uh, a response spectrum is pretty much you know, PSA versus period. Um, what does it represent? It's a metric, it's an intensity measure. Right now it's the best intensity measure that we have. Uh, we're looking at other intensity measures, but this is the one that forms the basis, especially because it's so easy to relate it to strength design. Um, and it defines the demand at your site. Uh, it's, the it's defined as the maximum response of a set of damped oscillators to your input ground motions. So it's spectral acceleration versus period, um, but it's pseudo spectral acceleration. And I will tell you what that means. So the damped oscillator is a single degree of freedom system. So it's not your whole structure. This is meant to be representative. It's a model. 
Okay, and so it is allowed some generalities because that's all you can do. So you take your elastic stiffness and mass and you can compute the natural frequency or period as the square root of K over M. And then uh, we're typically working for ground motion selection and scaling with 5% of critical damping. Um, what we do to compute the, design, the pseudo spectral acceleration, the PSA is you subject your, gram, your system or the different systems that you see here, uh, different heights are just representing different stiffnesses and masses. And you input the same ground motion to all of them and they're all gonna have a different type of response, which is what you see here in these different figures. Uh, something that's very stiff, it's gonna have small deformations uh, and high frequency response, while something flexible with the longer period range is gonna have a larger displacement. Uh, and you can see that even the frequency content of your response is different. Uh, you take all these, you compute the maximum displacement response, sometimes it's plus or sometimes it's negative, but you take the absolute value and you plot that as a function of spectral period. This spectral displacement is the fundamental metric that we use, but in elastic system, you can convert that into a pseudo spectral acceleration and which is just omega squared times SD. And that's what you plot and that's what we compute with PSA versus uh, period. Okay. It's not an acceleration. It is not the maximum acceleration in your response. Okay. Because then when you get into accelerations, things get complicated because is it relative? Is it absolute? Do you account for damping in these different, there, there's different components to the acceleration. So the spectral displacement is just always the easiest. And of course, it's a relative displacement. And that's what that P in front of PSA stands for. Okay. Very important because oftentimes, for me, as an English learner, uh, language is important. Uh, so I, I always want to make sure that we understand and we're talking about the same metrics. Now, when you're talking about ground motion models, uh, the GMPEs, the NGA or different, um, the NGA are more for regional ground motion models. Some people have developed ground motion models for other uh, seismic zones as well. What ground motion models do is they study all the data and the physical constraints and the develop estimates of the spectral acceleration as a function of site, event, and path characteristics, okay? The site is typically your VS30. The event is magnitude and the path is the distance, okay? These are important because this is what we use in our ground motion analyses, all right? In our deterministic and probabilistic analyses, we actually use these ground motion models. The ground motion models predict a median as well as a standard deviation, okay? So when we're talking about later in you know, the 84 percentile, that is the median plus one standard deviation of your ground motion models. And these are developed looking at large databases of ground motion. So I work on the, at the very end of the NGA West 2 and NGA East, as well as on, in a, on the project for the NGA subduction. So the, those are the big well-known projects, but there's a lot of different ground motion models uh, that are developed sometimes for very specific regions. And so I want to make up, make sure that you understand when we're talking about ground motions, we're talking about spectral acceleration at the same time, okay? If we're talking about records, then it's the records themselves, okay? And so this is the main definitions that we're going to carry through, and it's in the main jargon when we talk about ground motion models and ground motions for analysis, okay? And so I like this picture to give you a real good idea of what's going on. Remember, long periods have large displacements, short periods have larger accelerations, okay? Now, there's that's just the spectrum, and that's a response spectrum. A response spectrum is typically for an individual ground motion, but then we've got these design spectra. Oftentimes, they're also just called response spectra as well, and there's many different ones, and we're gonna cover all of them because they've got different levels of hierarchy and one is built on the other. And so in order of importance, the most important one in engineering practice is the risk targeted MCE sub R. This is what you get for, that's your target spectrum. And then you take two thirds of it and you get your design spectrum from your site for you know, an ASC seven type of analysis. The risk targeted spectrum is made up from the uniform risk spectrum, the uniform hazard spectrum, the deterministic spectrum, which doesn't have initials for it, and the deterministic lower limit. And I'm going to cover all these because I think they're very important to understand what controls the seismicity at your site. And, and that's important when you do your ground motion selection and any type of 
hazard or analysis for your site. Okay, now these are in order of importance. I'm actually going to turn them over almost upside down and go through them because they're all going to be used to develop uh, your MCE sub R. So the very first pair are the deterministic spectrum and the deterministic lower limit. Uh, the deterministic spectrum is you look at different scenarios at your site or near your site. So you may have uh, here in the picture, I have two different sites. Uh, you may have you know, a small earthquake near your site. And so using ground motion models and ground motion prediction equations, you determine a spectrum for this event. Uh, you look at the magnitude, you look at the distance, you look at the VS30 at your site, and there's a whole other parameters if you have basin effects and this and that. Um, and you compute a design spectrum for this scenario. Then there's another scenario. You look at the next scenario. You literally numerically go through, and the, the programs that do this uh, go through many different, it takes a while because you run through all these different magnitudes. You could have a, a magnitude six or a magnitude seven, a magnitude four, depends on uh, your event. So typically in a deterministic, you look at the biggest event at your site at the nearest distance, because that you know is going to be the, the biggest shaking for that scenario, or at least for that fault. And so for an example, in LA, there's many different faults and you look at all of them. So you look at the second event and you compute your spectrum for that and you go on, you go to, maybe you have a much larger event farther away, but because it's far away, maybe the accelerations are, are gonna be higher in one part of your spectrum and they're gonna be different in a different part of your spectrum. And so you go through all these different scenarios and you take an envelope of the response spectrum for all of these scenarios. Now, we don't look at the mean uh, predicted for all these different scenarios. We look at the 84 percentile. OK, so you look at the spectral acceleration that is the mean plus to end, you know, one standard deviation above the mean. So it's a pretty conservative. It's not the biggest earthquake that can happen. OK, it's, you know, it's the one that I would say most likely, right? 84%, you know, there's still a 16% chance that you will get a bigger event, okay? And that's important when you have many different faults near you because that 16% adds up, okay? Which is why then we will go to probabilistic. But right now we're looking at the deterministic. We look at all these different scenarios. We build an envelope of these different response spectra and uh, that's our deterministic spectrum. OK, then the building code has come in and they've set a deterministic lower limit. In ASC 722, this deterministic lower limit is different. It's based on, uh, it used to be just 1.6 and 1.1 that, you know, just sim very, something very simple. Uh, now it's a little bit com more complicated. And what it does is it sets a lower bound for the deterministic spectrum. OK, just in case you just didn't consider everything, um, or just to kind of make sure that, you know, your deterministic spectrum doesn't fall too low. Um, and this comes into place often with, for sites that are between two moderate faults, okay? So for example, there's a spot right downtown LA in San Francisco that is halfway between the San Andreas Fault and uh, the Hayward Fault, and so it's actually controlled by the deterministic lower limit. There's a lot of regions that are controlled by this. Why do I, what do I say controlled? Because the building code tells you that for the actual deterministic spectrum is to take the maximum of the two. So first you compute your deterministic spectrum for all the different scenarios. Then you compute your deterministic lower limit and you take the maximum of those, okay? And we're gonna put this in your pocket because we're gonna use it later to compute your MCE sub R, okay? So when we're talking about deterministic analyses, this is um, what the deterministic spectrum is. It has a, a lower limit, okay? Uh, oftentimes, and you will see it when we do the MCE sub R, the deterministic spectrum is important in when you're near uh, faults that large magnitude or you know very close to faults in regions. So for example, right along the San Andreas Fault, uh, this is very important, okay? And I will show you why. OK, so that's a deterministic spectrum. Now we switch over to looking at the probabilistic effects and things get interesting and a lot of fun math uh, comes in. So what the probabilistic spectrum does is it takes into account the likelihood of your scenarios. 
okay? Because you may have a very large event, but it's very rare. And so should we be designing for something that rare? Now, remember, we were talking about variability already in the ground motions, right? The ground motion models have a mean and a standard deviation, right? But now there's also an additional parameter of the probability of that event actually happening, okay? And so what a uniform hazard spectrum does or probabilistic spectrum does is it takes into, it does that much more integration of looking at your scenarios as well as the probabilities of the scenarios, okay? And it, integrates it all and adds it up, okay? So for example, we may have very likely, we have you know smaller events that are more likely to happen. Okay? And oftentimes when we're talking about probabilistic, we don't just look at you know what is the likelihood of a certain event happening. We're more interested in what is the likelihood of a certain event being exceeded, right? So it's not just a magnitude, oh, what is the likelihood that I get a magnitude seven, it's more what's the likelihood that I exceed a magnitude seven, that I get a seven, eight, or something above that, because that's what really matters. Okay. And then we can convert these using the ground motion intensity, the ground motion models. We can convert these magnitude and distances with probabilities to spectral accelerations. And so now we compute probabilities of exceeding not a scenario, but a spectral acceleration. Okay, and each ground motion, each spectral acceleration has a likelihood of being exceeded. Okay, and so we develop these hazard curves, okay, which is spectral acceleration on the horizontal axis and then probability of exceeding that spectral acceleration in the vertical axis. Okay, and this is done for every fault source that within 200 kilometers of your site, 200, 300, you decide. Uh, it depends on the tectonic regime, right? And so you do this and you can look at it in probability of exceedance in 50 years. Uh, you can look at it as annual rate or you can look at it in return periods. And with Poisson distributions that you can, there, there's a math equation that can relate all these, okay? And so what we do is we look at, so for in this case, we look at the Hayward fault, we look at the Calaveras fault, and for each one of these faults, we have a probability of exceeding a spectral acceleration, right? We're combining the ground motion model with the probability of exceeding a magnitude, and we get a hazard curve for each one of these sources. So if I'm in the middle of all these faults, then I have to add up the probabilities, right? So let's say I want to, what's the probability that I'm going to get 1G? Well, this fault here can cause 1G, so the Monte Vista Shannon. This red fault, the Calaveras fault, can also give me that probability, that ground motion. And so you have to add them up, right? And so what's the probability that I'm going to get really large shaking? Well, it's not just based on one fault. If I have many faults near me, the probability goes up. And that's why looking at the probabilistic analyses is important because in zones with a lot of faults, then they all add up and it's very important. And that's what that takes into account, okay? What we then do is we take these and at each probability, we add them up and we look at a certain probability level at a hazard level, right? So in uh, ASC7, we look at the 2% probability of exceedance in 50 years. And so we add them up and we get a spectral acceleration. I'm sorry, prob from this probability, you get a spectral acceleration at that return period or at that probability, okay? Now, this is spectral acceleration probability, but we have a spectrum. So we need to do this at every period, okay? And so you've got these hazard curves. So these are on the left is where we had the dash. These are the total hazard at your site for each period. And we look at our return period or annual rate of 2475. And for each period, now we plot it into spectral acceleration versus period. And so this blue line here corresponds to the 2475, the 2% probability of exceedance in 50 years. Uh, there's higher ones that have lower probability of exceedance. And then maybe let's say this purple one could be the 475, let's say. Okay, it's actually here, I have it labeled, it's this dark blue one here is the 475. Okay, and they're all done that way. They all come in from the hazard curve. So the hazard curves are really the, the root of what you do and, and they tell you everything about your site 
and I'll show you where that comes in afterwards, okay? So that's how we get our uniform hazard spectrum. Until ASC7 something, we were designing for this 2% probability of exceedance. Well, now we're like, wait a minute, that's all hazard, but what about taking into account this structural response, all right? And so then this is when finally structural engineers got involved um, and started developing fragility functions, okay? This is when you run and I have mixed feelings about fragility functions, but you run a lot of analyses and then you plot, again, remember our intensity measures, always spectral acceleration or in hazards, they look at spectral displacement, they're related. And you look at what is the probability of damage? Okay, and this now brings in your structural response. So for different intensity measure or for different spectral accelerations, so for strong shaking, different, you may have you know, different kinds of response. So for example, let's look at strong shaking. So you've got a large event. Well, we have a 20% you know, probability of complete damage. <coughs> then we have a 70% probability of being extensive or above damage, uh, you know, much lower probability of having very little damage. And I'm sorry, I'm, you know, there's, Oh, uh, very little damage or above of exceeding this moderate damage. And, you know, it's pretty much only under weak shaking, maybe there's some probability. Under strong shaking, you're definitely going to have slight, moderate, expensive, or um, complete damage. Okay. So that's where these, you know, uh, fragility functions come in. In the building code, we're looking at probability of collapse. So it would be this very last curve here. And so now we're taking in spectral acceleration and a probability of exceeding a certain performance objective, such as collapse, all right? Now we're gonna take these, and because we've got the spectral acceleration and we're gonna combine them with our uniform hazard spectrum, and we're gonna get a uniform risk spectrum, okay? And so this is where the risk integral comes in. Uh, it's pretty straightforward math. I don't know why people are so afraid of integrals, but all you're doing is you're combining the hazard curve and the fragility curve together, because you're combining the different probabilities and you get a risk of collapse, all right? Because now before our fragility curves were a function of spectral acceleration, but that spectral acceleration has its own probabilities, okay? And so that's like a conditional probability, all right? Which is what we had here. So if we take the different components of this, uh, we talked about the different hazard curves, and uh, the different spectral, you know, the, the probability, conditional probability of failure as a function of spectral acceleration. We put them together and you get your risk of collapse. And so Nico Luca's done a lot of work on this in, uh, for the USGS. And so this is where he's got a lot of presentations and papers that show the importance of bringing in this risk of collapse overall uh, for, you know, for the national maps, okay? Because what we want to do is we have, we want to have a uniform risk of collapse across the entire country, right? So why would you have more risk in one region and then why in another, okay? And things get interesting in the next step. But, and so you'll see that, for example, he's comparing Memphis and San Francisco that are 2% in 50 years is pretty much the same. They have very similar accelerations a 1.4 versus 1.5 Gs, okay? So the uniform hazard spectrum is gonna give you the same design values, but the hazard curves are different, okay? This is that total because they have different sources. Maybe in the Memphis only has one big fault or one big type of fault, while San Francisco has many different ones. And so the shape, because you're adding different hazard curves, comes in and it's different. And so this is when people talk about the slope of the hazard curve, because now you're going to integrate it over a whole, you know, from zero to infinity. So the whole shape comes into account. So this is on the top left, uh, we've got, you know, our hazard curve. We combine it with a fragility curve. The USGS uses a uniform fragility curve, uh, which with a beta of uh, six and a 10% probability of collapse given the MCE. And so for these two sites right now, this would be the same hazard curve, just slightly different, okay? Um, and I welcome you to you know, learn more about this. If you do this, 
and you integrate the two, you get the numbers that the probability of collapse in 50 years in Memphis in the blue is 7%, while in San Francisco, it's 1.5%. So now we don't have the same risk of collapse. So what the process goes through in determining a uniform risk is what at what point do we take this curve, the fragility curve, and we move it left and right until and it's an iterative process until the two curves, the risk curves, come out to be the same. Okay. This is something that the building code does. They use a simple model, but in the building, this is what USGS does, the mapped ones, but you're welcome to do this yourself as well and use, you know, maybe a more accurate uh, fragility curve. So if you move around this fragility curve left and right to find out at what spectral acceleration will you get the same probability of collapse, uh, this is the process that you go through. And so this is, you know, the very last step uh, in the risk integral, you see that this is the example. This is something he wrote in 2006. He was looking at 1.5%. Now we look at 1%. The two sites have the same probability of collapse, but they've had to shift the same fragility curve, which means that now our ground motions for San Francisco are going to be 1.5 G, but the ground motion that we designed for to have a 1.5% probability of or whatever you want it to be is actually 1 G, OK? And that's where that risk coefficient comes in. All right, this was that in-between step is what it was for the 2% and 50 and how that gets modified, okay? And so this is the process and I wanted to make sure that you, you understood. I, I'm, every time I go through this, I understand this a little bit more. It's a very simple, it's just math, okay? And so now we have uniform risk spectrum for the entire country. All right. And so now we have we select the ground motions. Remember, this is the spectral acceleration. This is your your spectrum that gives you. So you need to design to the spectrum that gives you the same probability of collapse across the entire country. OK. And so I mapped these where I'm working on some stuff for the building code. So I mapped these and I made these really cool interactive maps. OK. And what we found out that for a site class BC at a period of 0.2 seconds, You've got some really high hot spots, all right, even here in South Carolina, which is uh, where you're hosting, or I don't know where you are. I found out where the Carolinas are. There is actually in the red, you're looking at designing for 5Gs at 0.2 seconds. That's a really, really, I mean, people want windows in their buildings. So this, this is, uh, people don't like this, or engineers don't like this, because it's very expensive to do this. And so it's really difficult to sell this to your clients. Even if you look at a site class D at one second, of course, you know, the spectrum goes down, but you're still looking at a maximum of 3.6 Gs. And as you can see, what I did is I drew the faults on top of it. These hot spots, all right, are right in the region of right along the San Andreas fault, pretty much, or, you know, anywhere near these faults where we have faults. All right, so this is something when this came out in the building code, people put their arms up and say, wait, 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 what are you doing? This doesn't make any sense to us. Um, people struggle with the numbers as well as struggling with the concept of, wait a minute, I just want to design for the largest earthquake. And so then that's where the risk targeted MCE sub R comes in. It's the law, this is what ASC 7 does. Um, and in regions of very high seismicity, it's unreasonable to design for such high forces. And so they came up with setting a cap on their design values using the deterministic spectrum, okay? What happens when you apply this deterministic spectrum? Now we no longer have a uniform risk across the country. And interestingly, regions, where you put this cap, you're lowering the accelerations from your uniform risk, so or your uniform hazards. So now you actually have higher risk of collapse in these high seismic zones. And so this is the process that we're trying to figure out what to do with uh, right now in, in the next version of the building code. So it's, it's kind of interesting and exciting. Um, I'm gonna show you how to build this. Um, and then just to make sure that the very last one, the design spectrum is you know just defined as two thirds of this. So, the building code uh, or the ASC 7 
prescribes this process for you, okay? Um, this is whether you do a site-specific or this is even the same process the, ma the mapped values go through. But the mapped values, of course, don't set this cap of or this lower bound of 80%. OK, so the first thing you do is you compute your 84 percentile deterministic response. Remember, we did this before. You've got your deterministic lower limit. You take the maximum of those. OK, and you've got the MCE deterministic. Then you do a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And you plot it. I clicked before I was too fast, but it's this green envelope here. Now you compare the green envelope to the cyan envelope, and you actually take the lower bound of them, right? We set a cap. It can't exceed the deterministic. So in the short period, and this is just an example that I made up. In some cases, it switches, OK? But just to show you, this is all period dependent. So the green line up to this point is below the blue, the cyan line. So this is when the probabilistic controls. And then above here, we're cutting it. We're setting a deterministic cap defined by the cyan. So now your spectrum is defined by you know, the lower bound of these two curves. What you do then, if you're doing a site specific and that's where the building code stopped, okay? That's what you see in the mapped values. If you do a site-specific analysis, you got to make sure that you don't fall below 80% of the map spectrum. So you still have to go to the map spectrum, get an 80% of it, and then compare them that it has to be the higher of the two. Okay, so there's a lot of up and down and the other side, but you just this is easy to put into a program. And so your site-specific MCE sub R in this case is what you see in the red line. OK, and so when people ask you, what are you we defining for? What are we designing for? It's tricky because it de it depends on your period. It depends on your site class and it has it depends on so many different variables. OK, but this is the process of computing this MCE sub R. OK, now this is for site specific. You did this additional step for just the maps and they've done this all for you is the first step. Now the maps change. Now we're no longer, this is a site class BC, we're no longer designing for five and a half Gs or whatever it was. We brought it down to you know 4.4 Gs in certain regions. So still very, very high anyway. So it's not like this cap is, is changing anything numerically, uh, but in concept is, is pretty important. Okay, so the maps have changed slightly. Uh, and again, only in the regions where this deterministic controls. If we look at a site class D at one second, now we've gone from 3.6 to 2.7 maximum. So that's a significant, what is that? A 30, 40% drop, okay? That, that's a lot of money saved. And maybe you might actually be able to build this building. It still hits these regions. You still see some regions, you know, of course, in the West Coast, uh, the New Madrid and um, Charleston area that are hotspot in the country, okay? And again, these different locations depend on the site class uh, as well as your period, okay? The difference I think I've already highlighted between site-specific and mapped is that, uh, you know, there's that extra 80% check that you have to do in site-specific. And also keep in mind that the map spectra were developed with a uniform standard, it has to be, you know, reasonable and explainable and consistent across the country. Some people consider it conservative. It's not always conservative uh, because, um, and it also the process has gone through extensive review. They hold workshops and there's a lot of work and, and committees and discussions that go behind all this work that's done for the map spectra. A site specific spectrum, you hire someone local. They have a more detailed representation of the local seismicity and side effects. Uh, hopefully it's a better, and so you have a more detailed quantification also of the uncertainty, which sometimes can bring your spectrum down. It can be bring your spectrum up. And so site specific is not always going to be less than um, the map spectra, but you can expect it to be a better representation of the hazard at your site, as long as it's done well, of course. OK, and so that's the key difference between them. Now, what's interesting is until now, the other problem with the mass spectra was the shape. 
Well, this is where multi-period spectra have come in. The USGS now give you 22 periods, but the biggest change to it is the site classes. They've extended their site classes. That was, for me, that was the biggest problem is that you had a site class A, B, C, or D. So you had big changes. So what if you're on the border and you just happen to be on one side or the other, it changes your spectrum significantly. And you had to deal with the site amplification factors and this and that. So the, the new maps, the AC722 that have these multiple periods also have more VS30. So it's a better discretization uh, of the spectra. And so it's getting closer and closer to being a better representation um, of the hazard at your site. Okay, and I, I like this this shape because it's easier uh, to select records and things to a shape that looks more like a design spectrum, okay, or even a response spectrum. And so that's pretty much the main difference between the multi-point. And of course, every year there's new updates and everything that come uh, with the new mapped values. Okay, you can get these mapped values; they're easy to get. Um, you can go to the USGS. They have a web services. I love it because I just put that into Excel. Uh, it returns a JSON input, so it's very easy and to do. Uh, there's different interfaces. I believe the ASC7 tool, one of these actually has ASC722. I'm not sure that they're all updated. to. Most of them are ASC716, but I believe one of these also has ASC722. So it's a graphical user interface that uses the USGS web services. So if you have a lot of sites to do, you know, GUIs for me are so 90s. Uh, the way to go nowadays is, is to put it into a web service and put that straight into Excel. It's very easy. That's literally what you put into, into your cell in Excel. Okay. So it's a lot faster and awesome. Um, and so it's very easy to get these mapped values. Okay. Um, and so that's pretty much where now we've got our target spectrum for your ground motions. It's going to be your MCE sub R, um, or it could be your design spectrum. That really depends. Or you can do the additional step of computing um, what they call scenario spectra, which is the conditional mean spectrum, for which, though, you have to do a little bit of extra work and you may need to do additional analyses as well. Okay. And that's a whole, that's where now you go off and learn about uh, the conditional mean spectrum. It, it was important to me to spend the time on the first part because the second part, if you understand the first part, it becomes easier to do uh, the second part. Many people go and select round motions blindly and then they ask questions or it doesn't really make sense because they've got way too many options and they don't know what to put in. Okay, so the very first step is you do ground motion selection. The building code tells you 11 records and they meet hazard consisting tectonic, tectonic regime, magnitude, distance, and additional things to do for near fault sites. Okay, well, you've done all this. You did the deaggregation, you did those hazard curves. But what those hazard curves were telling you was the contribution of each event to your hazard. And so now, if we're let, looking to represent this record here, this hazard level here, well, I'm going to have a bunch of records that represent the Calaveras fault. So that's got a magnitude and a distance. Then I'm going to have some records that are going to represent this blue fault, which is the northern San Andreas. Fewer records, right? Because it doesn't contribute as much. And remember, this is logarithmic. Uh, and then I look at these other two faults. Okay, the Hayward Fault. So this is a great location that has a nice diversity. And so you want to select ground motions that represent these different hazards. Uh, these all show the same spectral acceleration, but they have different magnitude and different distance. So if you go to the USGS Unified Hazard Tool or your um, whoever developed the ground motion suite or whoever did your seismic hazard analysis should give you a deaggregation. And these are really cool deaggregation plots that show you that, hey, you need to pick a few records that represent something close and small. And here's the San Andreas fault at about 86 kilometers. And so you need to pick a few records for that, a few records for the, I don't think the left and the right figures match, okay? It's not the same location. And so you wanna look at, you know, what, what type of different components. So this is, I, I think it's up in Seattle. So you need to have some faults, right? Seattle's the best place for seismic hazard because you've got your local faults, you've got the slab, and you've got the interface. And so your ground motion suite is going to have, you know, a few records from one and a few records from others. And so you may actually need to go to more than 11 records. 
Okay. Uh, once you've decided what your records should go, you can either have your own database or you can go to the NGA tools uh, from the NGA sub, uh, database. So I developed the 20, in 2014, I put in, I think the NGA West two, and then a couple of years later, I put in the NGA East. And then in the last year, I released the same portal for the NGA subduction. So these are different databases and you go to these different databases to select your records, okay? Um, and so those are one place. There's a lot of other resources where you can go. And if you know what you're doing, if you looked at your hazard, then it's very straightforward to define your target spectrum and uh, the different you know, magnitude and distance criteria that you need uh, for your ground motion suite. Okay, and it's all based on the deaggregation or you know, pretty much your hazard curves. Uh, that's why I wanted to make sure that we understood what hazard curves are. Once you've got your suite of records, now you've got to scale them, okay? And you scale or mod and or modify your records to match your target spectrum. Well, the building code tells you what to do. Uh, you've got, you know, they have criteria in the selection, then they've got criteria on the scaling. And right now, ASC 722 only talks about amplitude scaling or spectrum matching. Uh, and so if you have amplitude scaling, so they give you a period range. It's not the, over the entire period range. Um, and uh, amplitude scaling, the mean cannot fall below 90% of the target. And spectrum matching cannot fall below 110% of the target. Okay. What spectrum matching is what you see on the Top left, you see the amplitude scale where you just apply a scale factor to your ground motions or tight spectral matching where you modify all your ground motions to all have exactly the same spectrum in the period range of interest, okay? Because the spectral matching may bring in a bias, that's where that extra 10% comes in. Uh, because the shape isn't perfect in the amplitude scaling, that's where they give you that 90% allowance, okay? Um, in 2012, I put out the paper when I was at Dagan Cole, we developed the mean spectral matching. And this is a bad representation of it. It doesn't look like this on the left. But in the mean spectral matching, you modify the record such that the average of your suite matches exactly your target spectrum. So you do very little modification. You don't do this type modification. You modify the records very little because you were starting with an average that was already pretty close. Okay. And that's what the mean, the mean spectrum matching does. Now there's the issue because this is not in the code. And so we're working right now to making sure that this is explicitly in the code because and most people that use the mean spectral matching, they use a 1.0 penalty, quote unquote, instead of the 0.9 or the 1.1, you match the mean right onto your target spectrum. Um, in the last couple of years, um, Norm Abramson has brought in his method, which is just an extension of the mean spectral matching, where he's actually matching on the ROT D50 or the ROT D100, but you have variability. So while tight spectral matching, you match all the components. Um, in his method, you match the spectrum resultant, but you still have variability in the components, okay? And so that's a whole interesting discussion about what are these different methods, okay? Some have no variability and some have a lot of variability. And then the question is, what is the right amount of variability? Because if you select your records and you have a single scenario, you actually may end up having very little variability in your amplitude scale records. Okay, and so this is a hot topic of discussion right now. We're doing some research on it. What should that variability actually be? And what is the definition of Heiser consistent? Because, you know, Norm will tell you while well, you're already counting for that variability in the records. But because structural engineers, it's more complicated to have variability in your structure, we're replacing it with variability in your records. So maybe we do want additional variability on top of that because we can't put it in our structure. So let's put it into our ground motion. Okay. And there's a whole big discussion about what to do here with these different methods and how can we make them all uh, code compliant. Okay. When you do spectral matching or any sort of modification, you're actually going in and changing the frequency content of your records. Uh, you're putting in wavelets or it really depends on uh, the different methods that you're using. And again, it's the key on record to record variability as well as period to period variability. All these ridges up and downs can actually be helpful in your analysis because maybe you're at a high and then you're at a trough or a peak and a trough. Okay. 
Um, and so you can have these different approaches to your ground motion. It depends on what you're comfortable with, what you work through with your peer reviewer, and what is appropriate and cost uh, for your model. Now, just to kind of show you the difference between mean spectral matching um, and amplitude scaling, uh, the, here's an example here where you see there's not much variability, but just doing minor changes allows you to control not just the mean, but also the standard deviation. And so actually when you do mean on spectral matching, you can increase that deviation, that variability if you want, if your fit was just almost too good, okay? But you'll see that the records don't look very different uh, from your original records. And that's what's nice. And that's why, you know, a lot of people are using this method because the modification is minimal, but it gives you more freedom um, of, you know, matching your record because oftentimes you've got, so as you can see here, this is a good 20 to 30% drop here. And so if you have to meet the, the code goal of the code, you actually have to bump up and scale up your records. Um, I have only a few minutes and I'm sorry that I've gone into it, but to me, this is exciting stuff. Um, when we look at near field effects uh, for directivity and directionality, what I want to get across to you is directivity is pulse effects, is energy in a certain frequency range. Okay, it's it's independent of direction. Okay, and it's kind of like the Doppler effect is the way we see it. If you're if the wave is moving towards you versus if it's moving away from you. Okay, and in the near field, this matters and you have to take it into account in both the hazard as well as in uh, your records. Okay, you need to have enough records to represent that have this pulse because it could be damaging or could impose really high demands on your structure. So it's important. Directionality is about the orientation. Okay, pull normal, pull fault parallel as recorded. Okay, and or even polarity, positive or negative direction is important when you're dealing with hanging wall and foot wall effects. And so those effects are directionality that are taken into account at the very, very end. So the directivity effects need to go into your hazard as well as in your ground motions. Make sure that in the selection you have them and you don't remove the pulses when you modify them. Directionality comes in at the very end is how you apply the records according to what the ASC 7 tells you. Um, and then the other issue is how do we define it? Right now it's set at 15 kilometers, but we're looking to change. And here's just a graphic to understand the directionality of fault normal, fault parallel. You have to take each record, so these maybe are different recordings, and you need to compute, even though they're recorded in H1 and H2, you have to compute the fault normal fault parallel components, and then for your structure, apply them in the direction of the fault that you're trying to represent. Okay, it's simple. It's just vectors and it's math. The key is do not rotate the records. When somebody tells you they've rotated the records, they've done it wrong. You need to actually get the component and therefore you need to rotate the axes, not the records. And this is something I've, I've some people do it right, some people don't, and uh, it's been my battle in the last few years. But this is something important to take into account when you apply the records at the very end, okay? While the pulse and directivity, so this is not directivity, this is directionality uh, versus directivity is the pulses. The very last step is to apply the records to your model. Uh, this is where my presentation ends, and maybe this is where the fun begins. And my push is always, always use open seas, of course, um, because it's awesome and everything. So that's that's the best recommendation I can give you for the analysis part. So in summary, we want hazard consistent ground motions. Uh, we've got, you know, it's important to look at the probabilistic and the risk targeted ground motions because it takes into account not just your scenarios, but the likelihood of your scenarios as well as your likelihood of failure of your structure. In the ground motion modification world, um, there's a lot of uh, different ways of doing it. There's a lot to learn there if you're interested um, and always take additional considerations at sites near active faults um, as I've already discussed. And if you have any questions, I'm building a tool myself on that combines all the different databases and brings in all these different things. But I broke it the other day because I was trying to add a feature. Um, so you can always visit my website for additional resources. Um, so do we have time for questions or only three minutes? And thank yeah, you. Hi, Sylvia. So uh, hold on one second. We should have uh, 
Our next presentation should kick off at 3.05. So uh, you have, yeah, more a than a few minutes for questions. Wait, I don't know what time it is. It's noon for me right now. So is that three hours? Yeah, three yeah I'm minutes? sorry. It's uh, my clock is showing 2.58. So you have about seven minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, Wen Chiang, why don't you just unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Okay. Can you hear me? No, I think I, I muted myself. Here. You're good. So I just want to ask the last part you kind of mentioned not to rotate it, but if I understand, I swap the axis. Could you elaborate on it? Or what, what is the right way? Because you mentioned you one is the right way. Don't, one... You don't swap the axes, you rotate the axes. So the records are recorded and you've computed okay. the H1 and H2. Now what you want to do is you want to com compute the component of that recording in the fault normal in the fault parallel direction. And so you don't want to rotate the vector, you want to rotate the reference axes. And so it's literally the sign of the angle. Instead of a theta, you do negative theta. Um, and, and so I just recommend, I've done some video on this and it's, I, I recommend just sitting down and doing the math of it and understanding what you're actually trying to do. I think I've done a video on this and I plan to do more on that. Um, so basically rotating the vector, okay, rotating the vector. Not rotating the vector, you're rotating the reference axes. Right. And so it's interesting, if you go on Wikipedia and you look for the rotation matrix, as well as the reference axes rotation, it's, they're two different pages and, and they mm -hmm. show you and one has, and also be careful of the, how you define your theta positive and negative. And it's a really interesting, but it's all just vector math. All right. um, so it, it's something worth looking into further. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Tom, you always have questions for me. Come on, Jennifer. <laughs> Well, I, I think I've thrown a lot your way. Um, I hope that some different concept have stuck or at least you've written down words that, what I do is I just write down words that I wanna Google and then uh, there's a lot of other resources online where you can get some. Ashley, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi Sylvia, it's so good to see you. And, and thanks for a very good presentation as always. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that case uh, from Seattle that I also think it's very interesting when you have the convergence of, or the combination of different um, uh, tectonics there. So what are your thoughts on uh, input ground motion selection in that case? How many from, from each one of the contributions to the hazard? If you look at, all you have to do is, it really depends on the exact location that you're at. Um, but so, for example, if we go back, because that was that deaggregation was right there. You look here, and you kind of add up. See how these are like fifteen percent, right? So, um, and I think this even gives you a table. Actually, the tool gives you a nice table, and it's going to say, you know, the contribution from the faults, which is only one set of fault. It, there's a table in the tool that tells you fifteen percent. Let's say. Right, then slab is going to give you 30%. All right, it's in the table, or you can add up these numbers. And then maybe for the interface is 15%. And these should add up to 100%, though, of course. Okay. And so that's, to me, that's the fraction of the records you take. And so you're going to have, you know, three records from the interface, five records from slab. It looks higher, but then there's a much bigger spread here, for example. For example, okay. So I will take, you know, six records from magnitude uh, five to seven, or six to seven, let's say, uh, you know, six records for that at a distance of zero to ten. Then I'll do a distance from forty-five to eighty, let's say. I, I would spend a lot more time than this, okay, and look at the actual numbers. And I would look at magnitudes. These are my slabs, so these are going to be six and a half to seven, and I'm going to get four records for that. And then I've got these two ruptures, but this is, you know, maybe I'll go from, you know, 85 to 130 distance. So I'll get some subduction record, you know, of the interface records, and maybe I'll get two or three of those. Okay. And you literally look at it here. The hazard curves gives you the same thing. Also very, very important. It depends on your period. This is a certain period. 
it should say here, or I didn't, I cut it out. You have to look at your period, which means you have to look at many periods. Okay, and thank you, I forgot about that. All right, and the long period range, this is where, you know, the um, subduction events come in, right? Because they've got long periods, they dissipate slower. And so that's in the long period, those that gets what's filtered. If you have a very short period building, your deaggregation is gonna look very different. It's going to be controlled more by these nearby faults. So again, my typical answer is it depends. Um, but I would look at this. I would look at past experience, what you know, and, and just study it and see what people have done. Uh, but these are the numbers, and that's what's cool about understanding these hazard curves because these are just literally plots of the hazard curves, and that's why I wanted to spend time on.